okay, I, um, my computer shows uh, 8.31. So everyone else who's coming in will have to miss the first couple of seconds, but they can pick it up what they miss on uh, YouTube. By the way, someone pointed out to me, I didn't know uh, those who are listening on YouTube, you can actually speed it up. So you can listen at 1.5 speed, two speed, whatever, if you want. So uh, there you go. Uh, okay, let's get right into it. Um, I don't have any, uh, a number of people emailed me, but nothing I want to uh, uh, respond to um, online. I want to pick up, we're going to finish up with Orachayim, which is the uh, first section uh, of the book, and we'll even move into Yeridea. We're up for those who are uh, following. Um, Simon Lamed Aleph, so uh, 31. Let me introduce you to the question and, and, and then the, how I came to it, and then the individual and take you to Yemen. Uh, and a little bit about what uh, the Jewish history of Yemen. First, um, let me pull up my screen here. The, um, the, the question is, um, are frozen etrogim um, good from year to year? That is, you take an etrog and you freeze it, deep freeze, let's say, could you use it the following year? So uh, wh where did I come up with such a question? Believe it or not, it was inspired by this individual, Solomon Freehoff. Solomon Freehoff, um, an American uh, reform rabbi, uh, he, uh, he's, he's not like, I mean, for many years in Pittsburgh, by the way, uh, uh, at Rodef Shalom, he's not like um, the great reform scholars who had their background in Orthodox institutions. His whole life is in the reform movement. And what made him special is that he was an expert on the response of literature. They say he had the largest private collection of responsa in the world. Responsa are, you know, half the questions and answers. What we're doing right now, the first half of it is responsa. And this would be, I, I have to look where Harvard or Hebrew University catalogs uh, uh, this volume because responsa are cataloged by a certain number and then uh, library, Congress numbers, I'm not sure what they'll do. But he was an expert in the responsa literature. Uh, not only was he an expert, he also was the halachist of the reform movement. What does that mean to be a halachist of the reform movement? They don't accept halacha. Well, as the title of this book about him, you see this uh, uh, mentions about if, if things on the side you can't see, you can play around with the pictures. You can just, you can move on, on top, you can get rid of uh, my picture, you can do all sorts of things. But the, uh, the title of this book, uh, let me click on it so you can see it maybe better, uh, is... Uh, yeah, guidance, not governance. It was Solomon B. Freehoff and Reform responses. So Freehoff's attitude was that we have a thousand years, more than a thousand years of responsa. We're not throwing it out just because we're Reformed Jews. It doesn't, it provides guidance for us, but it doesn't, uh, doesn't control what we do. Now Freehoff, in addition to writing numerous volumes of responsa, responds in our time, all these different responses, probably 10 volumes for answering questions of reform rabbis who wanted to really do things in accord with the Jewish tradition when it didn't violate conscience or things like that. He also wrote two excellent volumes out of print for many years now. One is called um, The Responsa Literature, which is a history of responsa. And the other is called A Responsa Treasury, where he translated many of the famous responsa into English, and uh, you can, uh, he, he leaves out the halachic argumentation, but uh, uh, you can uh, read these responsa, which are very important historical sources. Uh, he had a lot of help, by the way. Uh, there was a rabbi in Pittsburgh named Wolf Leiter, or Zev Wolf Leiter, we'll come back to him later. Uh, in these classes, but he was a big rav and a posake, and he was very friendly with um, Freehoff. Uh, there was a time, especially before World War II, where Orthodox rabbis, Gedoli Yisro, had relationships with non-Orthodox rabbis. That's the theme, of course, of my book, uh, my little book, Saul Liebman and Orthodox, but it wasn't really such a problem. Samuel Belkin was very friendly with a reform rabbi in Providence. Uh, I believe he even stayed with him when he would go to Brown. Uh, uh, so uh, Wolf Leiter, he's, he's even mentioned in the introduction to some of Freehoff's volumes. We'll see later what uh, Rav Soloveitchik thought about this relationship, or at least what it said. Uh, even though Rav Soloveitchik himself had a very close relationship with a conservative rabbi named Joseph Shubo. And when all the Orthodox rabbis were going after Soloveitchik, they were his big opponents. 
in the Kashra scandals. They wanted to put him out of business. They wanted to put him in jail, even some of them. It was Dafka, a conservative rabbi, Rabbi Joseph Shubel, who stood up for Rav Soloveitchik. And uh, of course, the judge in the case was Jewish. And uh, it's because the Rav had uh, such a friendship and a good relationship with Shubel, you have to read the letter that he sends to the congregation, the conservative congregation, when he was invited to come to the synagogue to honor Rabbi Shubo, and he, he how can the Solveitchik, you know, uh, go to the conservative synagogue? It's a bit of a problem. So he writes this wonderful letter in the volume published by Natty Huffgott explaining that his not going to the synagogue should not be taken as a sign that he doesn't admire Rabbi and Mrs. Shubo, et cetera, et cetera. But so this is Solomon Friedhoff. So what does this have to do with the question? Well, Many years ago, I read a review of one of his volumes of responsa by the late Louis Jacobs. And Louis Jacobs says that he, he finds it strange, which I find it strange, I think you find it strange too, that here the reform movement doesn't accept basic things. Obviously we know Shabbos and Kashras, but marriage without, remarriage without a get. What's more important than getting a get if you're married? And yet the reform movement just says, that doesn't matter. We don't need to have, a, you know, we're married by the rabbi, but you, you get divorced, doesn't matter. We go by the civil, civil marriage. Uh, uh, so Jacob said, it's more than a little strange that uh, Solomon Frihoff doesn't care and throws out the whole idea of marriage and uh, divorce, uh, which are basic to Judaism. And yet he takes very seriously and has a whole response about whether you can use a frozen net stroke. Well, I thought that was an interesting question too. And interesting as well, but I thought the question was also interesting. A frozen net stroke, never heard of it. So when I was in uh, Harvard, my first year, I came across the Sefer of this rabbi. His name is Yitzhak Ratzabi. He's in B'nai Brock today. He's a Yemenite. Uh, by now, there's three volumes of Ola Yitzhak. In fact, the Chuva we're looking at was published in volume two. But I only saw one volume. And immediately, I was attracted to the, him and his writings for the simple reason, first of all, we don't have much in the way of the Yemenite responsa. In Yemen, they didn't, uh, either they didn't choose to write or they didn't know how to write. Uh, you know, their, their responses are like two lines. Here you have Rev Ratzabi writing lengthy responsa. But what really caught my eye was that even though he's a Yemenite and was educated in Ashkenazi Yeshivas, I think he even went to Kol Torah, he is not like so many others who forgets his heritage. He, he is publishing manuscript stuff from Yemen. He's constantly citing Yemenite authorities. That is actually significant. I don't know if you're aware of the fact that uh, typically you find Yemenites and Moroccans and everything, they study these Ashkenazi yeshivas and unfortunately they forget about their past. All they want to do is become Ashkenazim. Some even went so far as to change uh, uh, their names. What happened was in, in the 1960s, early 70s, uh, many traditional Yemenite, Moroccan, Tunisian uh, Jews, they, wanted, they didn't want to send their kids to the uh, secular schools and they were convinced to send them to yeshivas. And what do they know, Ashkenazic, Sephardic? There weren't any Sephardic yeshivas really in Israel then. All you had was Barat Yosef, but you didn't have like high school level yeshivas uh, read by Sephardim. So they sent, and they didn't want to send them, they were convinced not to send them to the Mamachti Dati for whatever reason. Uh, um, and these were not Haredim at all, but they thought they had this attitude that, you know, the rabbis, you know, Sephardim have a lot of respect for rabbis. Yemenites are not Sephardim, but they were put in together with the Sephardim. So when they come, they would come to these people and say, send your son to learn in our yeshiva, uh, they sent them there. The problem was that these Haredi yeshivas uniformly denigrated uh, the Sephardic approach. The, the Sephardic rabbis were not regarded as uh, serious Torah scholars. And often what happened is that the people who came out of these yeshivas, uh, they were embarrassed of their past. They didn't feel confident in their, their, their traditions. They became Ashkenazim basically. And they, they had to become Ashkenazim because uh, they were now in this uh, Ashkenazi Haredi world, um, which uh, maybe they felt lucky that it welcomed them and they sent their own kids to there. Uh, but they, they themselves could not find Shiduchim if they didn't become like Ashkenazified. And their children certainly couldn't find Shiduchim. And this continues to this day. The story has yet to be written about the discrimination and the uprooting of Sephardic culture among the Haredim. Um, we know about in the secular world the way they uh, treated the Sephardim. But the same thing happened. Ironically, Rav Shach, Rav Shach, who more than anyone else opened up the gates of dispute in the Haredi world. 
before Rav Shach, you didn't have the terrible disputes, not just between the Hasidim and the Snagdim, but in the Haredi world itself, which continues to this day. I mean, just last week, um, a group of kids from the Pelag, two of them, um, confronted Rabbi Feivelson, he's a leading Musa authority uh, in the mainstream Lithuanian world, with a knife. And they threaten him, if he doesn't stop teaching, there will be consequences. So, I mean, what's going on today, you can't even imagine. But Rav Shach, who was responsible for a lot of uh, this uh, because of his very strong uh, approach on certain matters, he, Dafka, was a big defender of the Sardi. And he fought against the discrimination of the Sephardim and fought to get them into yeshivas, but it didn't help that much. And the truth of the matter is, all this talk of Das Torah, it's, it's very hard to break down um, uh, these, these discriminations. So when I see a figure like Rav Ratzabi, who comes out of the Ashkenazic yeshivas and um, still is writing as a Yemenite, this is someone that I wanted to have uh, a connection to. Now, what I mean by connection to, and this answers one of the questions last week, there are very few people in the book that I have any personal relationship with, that is, uh, that I went to speak to them personally. Some of them I did. And, but the others, I really don't have any desire to. There's, it's almost like I decided to join, and through the book, it's a creation, I joined the Republic of Letters, I guess you could say. If you know the term Republic of Letters, in the uh, 17th and the 18th century in Europe, um, you had this the idea of the Republic of Letters, where people would intellectually correspond about important issues of the day. Well, we've had a Republic of Letters since medieval times. My interest in corresponding through Rav Ratzabi is simply in an intellectual Torah matter to hear his great insights. His politics, I couldn't care less. And I wouldn't even, you know, I don't even know if, uh, you know, I'd be able to have a good conversation with him because some of what he says, I'd find like just this page, by the way, you can look down. Uh, I got his picture, but it's, it's Ratzabi saying, Ramli, this actually put in Chayrim. So you're dealing with, but nevertheless, uh, I, don't, I don't like putting people in Chayrim, but, but he's an amazing person in terms of his learning and his way he's able to join, uh, like he's against going to the army, all these things, that's not my approach, but it's okay, because I'm just interested in the intellectual and the Torah correspondence, not the personal, so I never really had any desire to go meet him personally, like some of these figures, I'll tell you about some of them uh, I have, just uh, to connect in a certain way, and this Republic of Letters continued, it continued by the 19th century, you had the Muscalium there, their own Republic of Letters, you have the letters of Shear and Shadal. The second half of this book is sort of moving in to that Republic of Letters. The first half is more uh, uh, traditional uh, responsa. So we'll get, there'll be a number of letters I have with Rav Asabi, and I'm very impressed by him, but again, it's the sort of, uh, it's sort of, uh, I'm very happy from the distance. Um, Sometimes you wonder, you know, you, you meet the people. I met some of the rabbis. I've never had a problem speaking to them, but what I find amazing is go on YouTube. For example, go look up Rav Yosef when Rabbi Scheinberg came to see him, or Rabbi Vazner. Here are the greatest Torah scholars in the world, and they sit together, and this is on YouTube, and they have nothing to talk about. It's incredible. I don't know what to make of it. They, they don't have anything to say. All they do is give each other brachos. When I meet with these great rabbis, I immediately start asking them questions and asking them to understand. There's a video also of Rav Mazuz coming to Lakewood. They brought him to Lakewood. He's sitting with the Rosh Hashiva of Malkio, and they have nothing to talk about. It's like, uh, I, I just find it interesting that people, even though they're great Torah scholars, such a different culture, they they don't have, uh, they, they don't speak, uh, but they speak in print. You see some of these people, they have Torah correspondence, but they can't, they can't shoot the breeze, let's say. Yeah. They can't talk about uh, matters, even can't talk Torah matters in person. Some people can't really speak in person. And everything has to be done through the pen, and others can't do it through the pen. They can only do it in person. Uh, we've had great Torah scholars who couldn't write Torah matters. Uh, in fact, Rashul Salant, not only they say he couldn't write, they say he physically couldn't write. I don't know how to square this with the fact that we have responses that he wrote, which recently was published. But they say he himself literally could not write. Um, so this is Rabbi Ratzabi. So who is Rabbi Ratzabi? Well, the Yemenite Jewish community, there really are three parts to the Yemenite Jewish community. Uh, in Yemen, you had uh, the Baladi. They were the old traditional Yemenite Jews. They originally followed the Rambam. And uh, then when the Shulchan Aruch came in, they adopted certain things of the Shulchan Aruch, but still a lot with the Rambam. Uh, and they also were influenced by Kabbalah. Then there are the Shami, who were much more influenced by 
by the um, by the Shulchan Aruch and by uh, printed text coming in. Um, and they're, they're pretty much today, I think, uh, although the davening is different, uh, they're pretty much uh, culturally one community. And then there's another group. And the other group is called the Dardaim. Uh, what, I, what I'm going to tell you now, uh, much of what I'm going to tell you is all about intellectuals. It's not about um, the masses. Uh, the masses, I think, today are not even aware of much of what I'm going to say, even though it split the entire community. Now, why do I say that? Because of the two groups, Rav Ratzabi is considered pretty much the leader of the Baladi, at least the halachic leader. And this individual, um, Rabbi Ratzon Arusi, that's his first name, Ratzon, Ratzon, uh, Reish Sadi Vav Nun, Ashkenazi wouldn't have that. He's the Rav of Kiryat Ono. He's a um, he's the member of the chief rabbinate, Mawetzet uh, Rabbanu Tarashit. He is also a PhD from Bar Ilan University. And he is the head of this group we're going to speak about now called the Dardaim, uh, what remains of them. So why do I say it's people don't realize the masses? Because my son-in-law's family is in his mother's side is, is all Yemenite, and they all live in Kiryatonu. So when they came in for the wedding, I, I tried to ask some questions. Uh, you know, what's do you know with the Dardaim? You live in Kiryat Ono, but uh, they, they were like, they didn't know what I was talking about. Uh, it, it, sometimes you have these disputes and the masses don't know. It's like someone pointed this out to me once, uh, Rabbi Slifkin, who at this time should have been in South Africa, like I was supposed to be today in, in Rome, tomorrow I'll start my trip. But, um, you know, on the internet, everyone knows the people who hate Slifkin, the people who support him, it's a big mahogas. Lo and behold, the average person I learned in your show has never heard of Rabbi Slifkin's the dispute over Slifkin's book. You might know now about Slifkin because of his museum, but this has only took place among intellectuals and quasi-intellectuals online. Not, but the dispute we're talking about, if you could go back into Yemen 150 years ago, the masses would know about it also. Who were the Dardai? Um, the, a group of um, Yemenite Jews led by uh, oops, this individual. Nope, I'll find them here. Uh, here, Rav Yechiakaf, at the end of the 19th, early 20th century, created a revolution in Yemen, a return to the rationalism of the Rambam, a rejection of superstition and of Kabbalah. And uh, that created a huge dispute which split the Yemenite Jewish community into really two the Baladi and the Shami on one side and the, um, the Dardaim on the others. His grandson was um, Rav Yosef Kafech. You see him here, the great scholar of the Rambam, who became the head of the Dardaim. That's together with his wife, Bracha. They are the only married couple to each win the Israel Prize. Rabbi Kafech won it for his Torah scholarship and uh, Mrs. Kafech won it for her, uh, she created a big charity uh, in Jerusalem. Um, today, the leader of the Dardaim is um, Rabbi Arusi, but they're really not the same group, the Dardaim, because if you go on the website, for instance, they ask about Kabbalah, Zohar. In Yemen, the Dardaim oppose Kabbalah completely, they oppose the Zohar. Rabbi Arusi says that, well, today we don't really oppose it. Uh, we understand it's part of the Jewish tradition. So he, he claims that there are no real Dardaim, which is not really true because there are plenty of people who are real Dardaim. And I, people have told me that he himself is a real Dardaim, but he has to uh, publicly put on a more moderate face. So he's a Talmud Mufak of Rabbi Kaf. Dardaim is, comes from a um, Dordea, or also there's a wise person mentioned in the Bible named Darda. They were called the Dardaim, and the opponents were called the Ikshim. Rabbi um, Ratsabi used to be a like a student of sorts of Rabbi Kafech, but somehow he uh, repented, he would say, and he became uh, a big opponent. And now all he does is bad mouth Rabbi Kafech and bad mouth the Dardaim. So that's obviously not something that I'm very happy with, but be that as it may, I, I wrote to him my question, because I said I was very attracted to this uh, approach of bringing in the old Yemenite uh, tradition um, which uh, is hardly known. And um, so that's the, the question. The, the answer itself is not uh, is a typical halakhic answer. You know, as I said, can you put it in deep freeze? You could save some money. And uh, the conclusion is that, uh, yes, you can. 
if you what you have to look at is the, there's nothing wrong with the metro gets old. There's no halacha that you buy a new metro every year. The question is if um, he says there's no kalim, you just have to look at it. If it's if it still has its its um, its form and it doesn't have anything puzzle that developed on it, so fine. Um, if if the um, if the, the cold has not uh, bowled ryuta, hasn't caused a kilko, has destroyed it. Uh, so if you have a, uh, a beautiful esrog, like on that movie, uh, um, Ushpizen, remember that beautiful esrog there? Or if you got yourself a nice big Yemenite esrog, the giant ones where you can actually get it in Borough Park, there's one guy, he's a Yemenite guy, he gets, I don't know if he gets them shipped or he has them himself. He wanted, he promised he wanted $300 for one. Uh, when I, I forgot about the big ones. Uh, but you could, if you have a deep freeze and you want to put it there and it's good, uh, the following year looks good, you can use the etrog again and again. There's no halacha that you have to buy a new etrog every year. So that is uh, Rev Ratzam. Now I'm going to take you, Simon Lamed Beis, we got two more Simeonim in Orachayim. I'm going to take you back to Morocco. And uh, this time, however, we're not going to hear from um, Rabbi Sholem Misas. We're going to hear from his son. His son is, uh, this is his son, Rav David Misas, who became, in fact, here in this picture, you see his father, uh, his mother, and Rav David Misas. Rav David Misas, who passed away only about seven, eight years ago, uh, he wasn't that old. Uh, not long after his father, he became the chief rabbi of Paris, having grown up in Morocco, where French was his first language, uh, because he grew up in Casablanca. In Meknes, where he was born, Arabic was still the, the language. Then in Casablanca, though, and as he got older, it became French. He grew up in the French uh, system. He knew French, so he became the chief rabbi of Paris. He had a university degree. He also was given that picture, you see, where it says, um, this picture where you see my... Uh, I'm showing you, he was given like, that's where he appeared because he got this uh, special legionnaire award that, they, that uh, France gave him. But for many, many years, he was the chief rabbi of Paris, which is majority now, uh, Moroc uh, uh, well, North African. Uh, you have Moroccan and Tunisian and Algerians. But um, ha having come from Morocco, he's someone who uh, I could ask uh, a question to. Uh, unlike his father of Sholem Messas, I never met um, him personally. Um, and he never published any Svarim, uh, but he was a big Talmud Hall. I, uh, I wrote to him, getting back to the old question we had before, if there were no synagogues for women. They didn't go to synagogue, uh, um, and they didn't Dalvin. What about reading the Esther? I was wondering, did, did they actually hear Megillah Sester, or is this gonna be another one of these things that we really can't explain it, but they didn't do it because we, we're gonna see an, an example similar to that in just a minute. Uh, and I wouldn't have been at all surprised if he said that, uh, no, the minute was they didn't hear it even all oh, they, they uh, have to hear it because we have plenty of examples of this. I'll just give you one uh, um, which has nothing to do with uh, what we're doing, but I, uh, I wrote something about it recently, it hasn't yet appeared. In Iraq, in Baghdad, women did not do uh, Kriya. They didn't rip tear a garment when a, a parent died or a sibling or a husband or, uh, or a husband because they said it wasn't Sneos. Now, how, how is that possible? It's a halacha. The halacha says you have to, but they didn't. And no one said that they should. Uh, they, they was thought that that's whatever it is. That's uh, We have plenty of examples of practices in communities that coexist, even though they're in violation of open halachot, and uh, sometimes the rabbis fight against it, other times they try to say, well, uh, you know, there must be some explanation, we don't understand it, and um, I, uh, this, they just record the practice of not doing Kriya, they don't really have a, uh, uh, a good reason, but um, as I recall, the Benish, I'll check out the Benish Chai, I think he doesn't even try to um, uh, change the practice. We have many uh, such practices. We're going to see some as well. We're going to see some one in a minute. So I wrote to Rav David Masas. Often people in Israel pronounce it Mashash. It is not, that's if you come in Israel, but the name is really Masas. That's how it's pronounced in Morocco. So I asked him, what did they do with the Megillah Sester? Uh, did they come to the synagogue? Um, and did they hear the Megillah? 
In Jerba, since there's no place for the women in the synagogue, they, uh, many of the women, they come to the courtyard. Every synagogue has like, you go inside and there's a little courtyard and then there's the, uh, the synagogue itself. They could sit in the courtyard and many at home. So he said to me, I remember when I was in Meknes, which was a, uh, he says, it's an ir yadua biaduta. It's a city that's known for his Judaism and they would call it Jerusalem of Morocco. When you come on the Morocco trip, although some of you have already been on the Morocco trip, I see, we will go to Meknes. We'll see the synagogue. We'll see, we'll talk a lot about Meknes. Um, he says there was no place for women in the shoals. Because they, when they say there's no place, today they have a place for them, but uh, there was no place. They didn't build a place for them. Their attitude was that uh, synagogues are not for women. Uh, synagogues are for men. Women are for other things. Uh, he says when we would return home, after the Suda of the Tzom, after the meal of the fast, what he's saying is that after reading the Megillah, they would have the meal at the synagogue to break the fast of Tiny Sister. Then we would read the bracha with the Megillah for the women. And also in the morning after Shachris, we'd go home and read it for them. So women, of course, didn't go to show, we would read it for everybody. Then he says, but in recent years, when they built new synagogues with Ezra's Nashim, the women would come to the synagogue in Casablanca, they would hear the Megillah, but in most places they would hear it at home. He says, this is what I remember from my youth. Um, I actually think he's uh, misremembering because uh, he actually goes to Casablanca when he's five years old. So he's recalling Meknes, but we'll see that uh, based upon what his father says, he, he couldn't be recalling Meknes. He's really recalling Casablanca. Um, we're going to see just a minute that Meknes had a very strange minhag, an ant, another one of these anti halachic minhagim. I mean, I hate to say anti halachic though, because this is the minhag in Meknes, and Meknes was an ear of Ambi Israel with great Torah scholars. Uh, among the greatest Torah scholars there in Morocco were in Meknes. Um, so we will see in a minute what I'm talking about. Actually, we'll see right now. Simon Lamed Gimel. Simon Lamed Gimel. The last section in Orachayim, Orachayim is the section, the Shulchan Aruch is divided into four sections. The, the first one Orachayim deals with, you know, Shabbos and davening and everyday things. There's some, some strange things, so uh, no one is able to explain why it's not the Shulchan Aruch, it really goes back to the tour. But so for instance, Tzedakah. If you and I were writing the Shulchan Aruch, we'd put Tzedakah in Orachayim, Bukha Tzedakah, Avelos. Avelos is part of, uh, Everyday life, when someone dies, you uh, sit shiva. You'd think that would be in uh, Arachayim. Uh, but whatever, for whatever reason, uh, if anyone has a good reason for it, you can uh, send it in the chat. But uh, it seems that um, th those areas fit in better with uh, Arachayim than they do with Yoradea. But and, and because of that, uh, it, um, it used to be that some people, you know, you learn all of Arachayim and you don't know some basic halachos. Uh, um, so the, the next responsum is from this individual. I showed him last week, uh, young rabbi. I wrote to him in um, 2005. His name is Rafael Deluya. Deluya is a well-known Moroccan name. I wrote to him simply because he published this book, uh, Zohar Brit Avot. It's all about the Minhagim of Morocco. There are many, many Minhag books on Minhagim of Morocco. I myself have about 10 different books, Minhagim of Morocco. Uh, one of the best, it's, um, I think it's now four volumes, is written by uh, Rabbi Lebhar. Uh, I think some of the listeners know him. He's um, now Rabbi in Los Angeles. Before that, he was in uh, Montreal, uh, was he? I think he was in Toronto also, if I'm not mistaken, Rabbi Lebar. Uh, but he's a Moroccan and uh, he's so all about Minhagim and why all these books? Because many of these books, Minhagim, uh, really need to be justified because they appear to go against uh, the Shulchan Aruch. So you have to justify them. Often the justification is that these Minhagim existed before the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch says in the introduction, uh, that if you have practices that already exist, don't change your practices because of me. Uh, and there are also many practices which uh, people today look at, uh, especially in the Moroccan community. In the introductions to many of these books, they talk about how people who come from Moroccan homes, they go to these Ashkenazi yeshivas and then they come home and tell their parents that what you're doing is wrong. You have to change it. Uh, and they're trying to say that, no, no, it's not wrong. This is our tradition and it's based on uh, important authorities and um, 
uh, this gets back to the issue of not having confidence uh, in their own traditions. Uh, so these uh, books uh, are often trying to justify the Moroccan practices. One of the big things that Sephardim don't do, and uh, the Ashkenazi yeshivas have tried to destroy this, these Sephardic rabbis like Avad Yosef pushed back against it, was the Yichud room. The Yichud room is an only an Ashkenazi practice. No real Sephardi would ever do a Yichud room at a wedding. In fact, it's regarded as an abomination because uh, of, um, you know, it's considered unsneistic to do the Yichud room. And yet, uh, you know, the Ashkenazic Rosh Yeshiva have pushed the Sephardic students to do that. And uh, so that, that's one of the big ones. Another one is Sitzis. No, no Sephardi would have their Sitzis out. You're not supposed to. The Ari already said the Rav Yitzhak Luria, Tzitzis has to be inside. Tfilin are outside, Tzitzis has to be inside. So you have all these uh, people, they go to the Ashkenazi yeshivas and they tell them we have to wear your Tzitzis out. Um, and uh, you know the Moroccan rabbis don't know what they're talking about. So you have uh, books like this will explain why the Sephardic tradition is, Dafka, you wear the Tzitzis in. And the list goes uh, endless. If we're still in quarantine, God forbid, <laughs> in another couple of years, we can go through all the different Moroccan practices. But this is Reverend Fral Deluya. He was in the news just a couple months ago because he's one of the people, he's young. He's not, he wasn't the senior rabbi. No one's going to listen if he's the, uh, the authority. The, the major rabbi was Rabbi Elia Abergel. Let me get his picture from right here. Um, he also has a son in Los Angeles. So Rabbi Eliar Bergel is now maybe the senior, uh, um, here he is, the senior, uh, really, well, him and Rabbi Amar are really the senior rabbis. He's an based in Jerusalem, um, preserves the Moroccan tradition, about 11 volumes, I think, by now of, of responsa. He was the senior person. And so they wrote, you know, they came out with the Zoom, Psak before Pesach, a week or so before Pesach. If you recall, this Psak said, and it was specific, that uh, for elderly people and for those who are going to be very depressed, if they have no family contact, you can have a Zoom Seder. I don't see how really this could have worked because, um, it, well, if you have a Zoom like I have, it stays on. Most people won't realize it will go off after 40 minutes unless you have a, an account. It, uh, like a real account, it goes off after 40 minutes, and I'm sure it would go, go bad or something. In any event, uh, they did say that you could have a Zoom Seder. Um, it was based on the, the Moroccan tradition that on Yom Tov, you can use electricity. In Morocco, everyone put on lights on Yom Tov. So if you can put on lights on Yom Tov, what's the problem setting up the Zoom Seder beforehand? Uh, you're not doing anything on you. It's just, uh, you know, it's... Um, broadcasting you, but you're not making any changes or anything on it, which, as I said, probably would have gone bad or the, the screensaver would have come on. I don't know if it would have been such a great idea, but these were not reform rabbis or conservative rabbis. These were great Torah scholars. And unfortunately, in the news, it was portrayed as if if you're away from your family, you can do Zoom. That's not what it was. It was precisely for people who, uh, especially elderly people, people who would be really depressed, they've never been away from their family. You have an old person, let's say your, your grandmother, she can't do a Seder on her own. What is, how does she know how to do a Seder on her own? Uh, uh, or people who don't uh, know what to do, they will be depressed. They, uh, that, then they gave the heter for her. Uh, I know Rav Schechter, at least I'm told, was very opposed to this psaac, but he himself, he gave another thing, which some people could say is just as crazy. He said, you can call, call them. He says, on Yom Tov, call your relatives that are by themselves. He said, no, he said, you don't need to do the Zoom Seder, but call. So he's on tape saying, uh, on the, the RCA uh, uh, did a whole thing before Pesach. He says, call them. Um, Actually, no, no. He said, "Call them some on a different time." Uh, on the RCA thing, he said to, to leave. They, they should leave their radio on on Yom Tif, so they're not alone. But uh, but elsewhere, I, he said that uh, if you think it's a problem, call them on the phone so that they uh, don't, you know, because it could be pikuach nefesh even for some of these people. In any event, that was the psak. We don't need to get into the zoom psak. My sense is it really didn't take off, and. Uh, probably for the best. There were even some very liberal modern Orthodox rabbis who said it's a big mistake. I think the problem also was that how do you put the genie back in the bottle? Uh, once it, it's out this year, next year, what's it going to be? So uh, you have an elderly relative who can't come for the Seder, uh, so then you could also do it. So you know, maybe they would say, yes, you're right. It isn't just for the Zoom. It's for any time you have someone who's stuck in a situation like that. 
but he's a reliable Rav and he's an expert in Moroccan practices. So I wrote to him about the same issue, um, Megillah. Same time that I wrote to um, Rav Nassas, uh, and um, he points out that um, obviously there's an obligation for women to hear the Megillah. Uh, the question was though, what about a bracha? He tells us that in Marrakesh, Marrakesh is the great city of Morocco. When we come on our tour, to, we'll be in Shabbos in Marrakesh. There's, um, there's um, still a community in Marrakesh. Two shuls open every Shabbos. Houses you can eat. There's three houses that if you're a small group, you can eat there. Uh, also a great uh, Torah city and uh, Madonna even has a place there and others. It's, uh, it's, it's very exotic. Uh, but in Marrakesh, they didn't read with a bracha for the women. Why wouldn't you read for the women with a bracha? Hard to say. He doesn't know. He doesn't explain it. Uh, also in, uh, in the city of Sefru, they also didn't read with a bracha. In Meknes, he tells us, they would read with a bracha, but just the first brachas, not the last brachas. Haravat Rivenu, again, why? I have to look in the book to see if he comes up with some uh, possible reasons. What he also tells us, and this is, um, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, this is not just in Morocco, this is elsewhere. The question was, what about the bracha? We make the bracha on Mikra Megillah, on the reading of the Megillah. However, um, in, um, in some places in Morocco, they held that you should make, when you made the bracha for the women, it should be Mishmoa Mikra Megillah, um, because they have an obligation to hear, not to read. I, I don't exactly know what that means, because what does that mean, an obligation to hear? If they don't hear, they have an obligation to read. Women, <laughs> women can also read. But that was the tradition. So in some places, they read it differently. And then he says the same thing we saw, that in Morocco, they didn't come to synagogue at all. So they would read it for them in the house. But this is the interesting point. And this is why I say on page 60, the last paragraph, why Rav Dov Masas does not remember. Because, um, and this is testified to by his own father, Rav Shalom Masas, as well as in other sources, Rav Yosef Masas, that in Meknes, as well as other places in Morocco, women only heard the Megillah at night. They did not read the Megillah for them in the daytime, and they did not um, hear it during the daytime. Rav Yosef Masas has a response of dealing with this. It's trying to come up with some explanation. It's an opposition to the Shulchan Aruch. It's an opposition to the standard halacha that women need to hear the Megillah in the evening and in the morning. And yet I tell you, and in this great Torah city full of great Torah scholars and rabbis and halachists, women did not read the Megillah during the, and that was the minute of the town. Women didn't read the Megillah and they were never thought to be obligated to read the Megillah in the morning. And this probably predates, this could go back to the time the Spanish exiles came in. That predates the Shulchan Aruch. Um, and that, um, although we don't have it in other uh, Spanish uh, diaspora places. But so the, here's an example of a, uh, a practice which is apparently anti-halachic in quotes because it goes against the Shulchan Aruch and it goes against the standard halacha, but this was the minhag in, uh, in Meknes. That's why I said with David Messas, when he remembers as a child, he wasn't remembering, in my opinion, in Meknes in the morning. He was remembering in Casablanca reading for them in the morning because in Meknes, they didn't read for them in the morning and there was no assumption that the women had to hear the Megillah in the morning. Ad Khan section Orachayim. Now we move into the next section of the book, Yoridea. And uh, the first question, um, in fact, let me, before we go on, I just, um, I'd like to show you things. Um, and I, uh, I, I see, I don't have the picture I want to show you. Um, let me see if I can just quickly uh, pull it up. Oh, yes, um, okay. Um, really, Ari Zivotovsky has to be given credit, but I'm going to show you a picture of uh, Natan Sufkin in a minute. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, Ari Zivotovsky has a famous article on swordfish. Can you eat swordfish or not? Uh, in America, of course, no one eats swordfish. So. But I was interested in this in a long, for a long time because I knew that Jews ate swordfish. The uh, Chaim Benvenisti, the Knesset Sagdola, speaks about the dog Hacherev. Jews ate the dog acherev. Uh, so how did it happen that Jews stopped eating it? And uh, uh, the real reason, if you want to know the truth, is Rabbi Tendler. 
And Chief Rabinick gave Hashkacha on um, swordfish into the 1970s as a letter of correspondence between Rabbi Unterman and Rabbi Tendler. And Rabbi Unterman's response with Rabbi Unterman explaining why swordfish is kosher and Rabbi Tendler explaining why it's not. And they, um, so they had the whole um, back and forth there. Rabbi Tendler was able to prevail in America. He was able to prevail eventually in Israel. In Italy, as of Rabbi Zivotofsky's article from about seven, eight years ago, you could still get kosher swordfish. In other words, the rabbis there still said it's kosher, but pretty much it died out everywhere else, but not completely. So for instance, at the Rabbi uh, Zivotofsky had the halachic suda, and then Slifkin also had halachic suda, and they served swordfish. They served swordfish in Jerusalem under the shkacha of the Jerusalem chief rabbinate. And as of a few years ago, you can still get it in a lot under the shkacha of the local rabbinate. Here's a, I just pulled up the uh, Google that um, here you see Rabbi uh, Slifkin and his halachic suda with a swordfish. You see the swordfish right there? So they're sorv serving swordfish. Um, and you can do a lot of uh, discussion about this. The issue is, is it, does it consider its scales or not? Although they, uh, I think it's the Knesset Gudola, he's the one who mentions that when the, they come, the scales fall off when it comes out, that's really not the case. So it's, but you don't, what they have is something on it which it looks like a scale. So in other words, Keskes Noah thought that the real, most of the scale just fell off. I don't think that's the case at all. It's, there's a, um, they say that there's a, the little thing, the question is, is it considered scales or not? And the problem was that no one ever saw a swordfish. But Tendler never saw it. And Isaac Klein, who was the conservative halachist, never saw it. What they did is they each wrote to this expert. He was the world's expert at swordfish at the American Museum of Natural History. And based on their questions, he gave them answers. And based on that, Tendler ruled one way and Isaac Klein ruled another way. It was only when Ari Zivotofsky from the Boston Harbor was able to get a swordfish that they could bring it to the different poski. None other than Herschel Schechter rules that swordfish is kosher. You can see this article from, he's online as well, in the Jewish press, he explains what, uh, how Rabbi Tendler is wrong. Although he thinks Rabbi Tendler, what Rabbi Tendler did was good because he, he was able to shrug up the conservatives to show them that they have no business getting involved in matters of halacha. But the truth is, Rosh Hashanah says that the conservatives were right in this case, that a swordfish is kosher. And uh, he ends Lamaisa, the conservatives were right in this issue. Um, so a friend of mine, is a rabbi in one of the areas with a uh, you know a vod there where they have a lot of restaurants and I and Rav Shechter is the posek for all the vods basically all these are all YU rabbis and he's the posek of the OU. Uh, so I asked my friend, does this mean that now all the restaurants in your area under the vod are going to be serving swordfish because the posek hador of America, the, the leading posek by far, no one even comes close. Um, has, and for the modern Orthodox communities and the right-wing YU communities, I mean, he's like the Urim Vatumim on, uh, on uh, Psaq, uh, and he's ruled that swordfish is kosher. So now the answer is no, because it's already been like 50 years, and uh, it's, um, you can't get people to uh, go back. It's almost like impossible. Maybe in Israel, if so, we start doing it, people get used to it. But even Refershal Shechter is not the Pope, that uh, even though he has said swordfish is kosher, um, the VODs and the OU, they, for all this time, they, they can't really change uh, uh, their opinions. And Rav Shechter saying is not out of the blue, it's not crazy. He says it's the Rav's opinion also, because let me show you something. Uh, oh, you gotta find it now. Um, ah, in 19, in the 30s, the, um, the Agudas Rabonim in America came up with a list of kosher fish. You see, it says sturgeon there. That's, I marked it because I wrote about this. Sturgeon also was thought to be kosher based on the Nota Behuda. The Nota Behuda thought sturgeon was kosher. It was a huge machokas in, um, in Central Europe in the, mid, um, in the late 18th century. But here you see in the mid 30s, they were eating sturgeon, but look below it. Swordfish is kosher on the Agudas Rabbanim, and this is in the 30s. So um, sometime in the 60s, due to Rabbi Tendler, my senses, we stopped eating swordfish, and uh, I haven't eaten it since. Um, Shachter also holds that um, um, pheasant 
Pheasant is a kosher bird. No question, pheasant's a kosher bird. Uh, you can go to um, Israel and you can get pheasant. Zivotovsky has a picture of Kafach Shechting it. Ramosha says he didn't want to matter pheasant because he says, we don't know if the pheasant we have here is the same they ate in Europe. Uh, the name could be the same, but it could be a different bird. But we have Masoma from Rakafach and others looking at our pheasant saying, no, this is the bird we shechted. And that's how um, anim birds, that's how you know a bird is kosher through tradition. So Rashechter holds, in fact, the rabbi of my show, Rabbi Spivak, used to teach Shlita at YU and he used pheasants. He told me he'd come to my house and he'd chuck the pheasant for me, do it in the bathtub, but my wife won't go for that. So I'm not gonna have, it. but uh, so pheasant's a kosher bird as well. But as for sturgeon, look at this, in Apardes, which was the rabbinic journal of all the gdoli, here's an ad for um, sturgeon. See the pasuk there on the left describing it. And if you, who, if you know Yiddish, it says here, uh, there's, sword fi there's sturgeon fish, gefin sich in the Rashima from the Buddhist Rabbani. You find this in the list of the Gunas Rabbani. For a kosher and fish, it's a kosher fish. Was magman im essen, you can eat it. The sturgeon fish is zer geschmack. It's very tasty. Un gutsu essen, it's good to eat. Then sturgeon fish can then become in by the, you can get in a Johnson smoked fish. Okay, so I wasn't asking though about sturgeon fish to um, the next question. The next question is to uh, Rabbi Moshe Basri. Uh, hold on, I have a picture of, uh, I don't have a picture of, uh, picture of his father. Um, Ezra, I wrote to his father, who is Rav Ezra Basri. Rav Ezra Basri is one of the leading rabbis from the Syrian community in Israel, from the Aleppo community, uh, Af Basin in Jerusalem, another Af Basin, there's a few different Bati Din in there. And, um, I wanted to know in Syria, did they eat uh, swordfish? Because we know that in, um, in, in Turkey, they ate swordfish. We know that in North Africa, in some place in North Africa, in Gibraltar, uh, there were people who ate swordfish. In Italy, they ate swordfish. So I wanted to know, did they eat swordfish um, in Syria? So he gave the, my letter, we'll see later a letter he sent to me, but he, he gave it to his son. I wrote to Rabbi Basri because he preserves also the Syrian Minhagim. And he writes, when you want to find out these things, you have to write to people who write. He also was the chief rabbi of Spain for a period of time. Even though he lived in Israel, he would uh, um, go back and forth to Spain. In his latest volume on Responsa, uh, there's a, there was the same one that includes the letter to me that we'll see later in the semester. There's an amazing letter. I don't know if the person who wrote to him because he included the letter that he received and also the letter that he replied. I don't know if the person appreciate would appreciate the fact that he's mentioned in the book. It's a guy writing it from um, Yeshiva Town. Uh, I believe it was even Lakewood. Uh, I think it was Lakewood. Um, uh, was it Muncie or Lakewood? I think it was Lakewood. Um, in which he says that, you know, he's trying to be honest. He's trying to do the right thing, taxes and everything, but all around him, people are, you know, making it seem like he's crazy. And uh, Rabbi Basri writes to him, encouraging him, don't listen to these so-called from people. They act, they look pious and everything, but they're a bunch of phonies, etc. But here you have testimony from someone writing how he's showing that he's trying to be honest and just the culture around him is not in that respect. So um, that's it's quite interesting. And uh, Later on, when I have the book, we'll, I, I can read some of it. But so the question is, the Minhag of Syria with the Kashras of uh, the Dag Uh He begins by saying that he investigated it with the people who came from al Sadi, Aram Sova. Aram Sova is the traditional way of saying Aleppo. I don't think there's anything left in Aleppo to see when we can go touring there one day. Everything's been destroyed. But he asked the, uh, the and, and the, the Aleppo, that's the main communities. If you go into Brooklyn today, you go to Panama, you go to Mexico, uh, it's really Aleppo. Yeah, you had Jews in Damascus. Professor Faor, who just passed away, he was from Damascus via Argentina. Uh, but Aleppo was really the, uh, the, the center of the community, the, the, the ban on conversions, all the stuff you hear about the Syrians, it all comes out of Aleppo. And Aleppo had real extremism in Aleppo. In Aleppo, they burnt the Torah commentary of Eliel ben Amozik, one of my heroes. Uh, Aleppo had some real extremists there, um, unlike, um, not, not Damascus, Aleppo. Um, 
don't think that uh, it's only Ashkenazim that have extremists. Art Scroll put out a book, even the uh, sages or scholars of Aleppo. Um, and there's this wealthy guy in the Syrian community in Brooklyn. He funded Svi Zohar, who's an academic expert on the Sephardic world, to write a critical review of it. Because as in typical Art Scroll fashion, uh, they left out all sorts of interesting uh, things that doesn't fit in with their approach. Uh, but he says he, he asked uh, the people from Aleppo, and the problem with in Aleppo is, he says, there weren't much fish there. <laughs> Aleppo, uh, you know, it's not on the water. There wasn't a lot of fish. And therefore, there are those who didn't even eat fish on Shabbos. And they didn't even know what this fish was. And then he heard from um, this other rabbi, Yitzhak Safrani, that um, they ate other uh, types of fish. He gave the names, but they did not eat the swordfish. Uh, and he says, that some told me that in Aleppo, there was a certain fish with like pointy, but it wasn't the Dag um, um, Although you really, if uh, you can look at a fish and if it has the, the fins and scales, you can eat it. You don't need a tradition. Since there's debate sometimes exactly, is this a scale or not? If there's a tradition, you don't even need to ask. Uh, I, there might be some people now from with us from South Africa. I know there's that issue in South Africa. I think it's what a clapfish or something like that, where the base din supports it, and the, uh, the there's a Haredi community there. They don't eat it, but uh, they've been eating this forever in uh, South Africa. And then he says, but look in the Knesset Gedola, who says minat pashut b'chol Yisrael. That means that everyone, all Jews, <laughs> it's funny, he says, Minat Pasha. What he means is in the Ottoman Empire, the Judaism he knows, uh, that everyone eats the Dag Acherev. Um, he said, oh, it is the Knesset Gedola. He says, even though it doesn't have the, um, the scales, it's because when it comes out of the water, it doesn't, uh, and he goes on. And then he just says that, you know, you can look in the Encyclopedia Talmudic, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, so the conclusion here is that if you're looking for a Masora, a tradition, you can't go to Syria. In Syria, they did not eat uh, the swordfish. Simon Lamed uh, Hay, and this I think will be the last one we do, or maybe not, uh, a tshuva from 1989 to Rabbi Greenblatt. When I first started learning some Yoridea, they had some issues. Um, there's nothing here, no great chachamas, no great wisdom. I mean, they're interesting, but uh, you don't need to ask Rabbi Greenblatt this. Uh, but um, my question was as follows um, that I asked him. Um, someone, who became, someone who made his, all his money selling basar b'chola, milk and meat. You're not supposed to get hana from that. Uh, um, what does he do now? He became religious uh, with all this money. And really, it's not even a, um, it, it's, it's explicit when you're in Yoridea, but uh, it's, uh, I didn't know this at the time, that um, it's, um, you can't, Basar Rechalov, you can't get Hana, you can't sell it, you can't Makadesh a woman, but once you've already done it, the money, the money is fine. Uh, um, so that's what he explains, and he goes into it a little. And then he talks about also the issue, let's say you own stock in a company, which is selling this, it's also not a, a problem. Uh, this is all people often ask, you have stock in the company that has Hamates, or that uh, sells uh, Charfos and things like that. It, it's not an issue. Um, Okay, well, time for one more, actually, because the next is Refersal Schechter, one of the earliest things I hear. This dates from 1985, the beginning of 1985, so 35 years. This is the first uh, letter I ever wrote to Refersal Schechter um, when I was uh, in BMT of Blessed Memory. And um, I was learning certain things, and, uh, I, and uh, I, in those days, he didn't even have a beard, but I didn't know, uh, I just heard at YU when you're at, well, BMT would have the people from Grus. Grus was a, um, I guess they still have it though, where they would go to Israel for a year or two. Really, you could do your entire smicha there, but mostly it was guys who came from a year. They were now obligated to, but if you were in YU smicha, YU smicha then was three years. I think now it's four years, right? You'd go for one year in Grus and you learned Torah Saret Yisrael, it was a great experience, guys would come with their wives, single, it was uh, Rev Lichtenstein would give shear there, Necham Leibowitz gave shear, or Dovey Miller really ran it, um, and um, I would always hear, it's the first time I heard really when I was in Israel, Shechter, Shechter, uh, he wasn't an international figure then, but I'm in the YU circles, even then as a young man, I think he's born, he's born in 38, so in um, 1985, uh, he's not even, uh, he's 40, 47. Already then, he was, um, and, and that was a time when you had people like David Lifshit, I mean, you had many other great people, but it seemed that the younger rabbis were always talking about Shechter. I figured, I had a question, let me write to Shechter. 
<laughs> in fact, I think so began the, uh, with this letter began my foray into the letters, into this Republic of Letters that uh, I've continued. I also have with the academic scholars, I have a whole list. Uh, for a while I was doing the political figures. Uh, so what were my questions to Rav Shachter? One is, um, it's interesting, and uh, I didn't know at the time, he discusses it in one of his Torah articles, which obviously Hoffman has a whole essay on it. There's a famous passage, it's um, quoted in a few different places, and the Sifrei, Rashi mentions it, others, that Bastin, Bastin tells you, you have to listen to what Bastin tells you, even if they tell you, Al-Yaminshu small, even if the Bastin tells you that was right is left, and was left is right, you have to listen to what Bastin says, they have the authority. The problem with this is that there's a whole Talmudic tractate, Masachat Horayot, Horius, as they call it in the Yeshiva world, uh, which the whole idea of it is that if the Bastin makes a mistake, not only shouldn't you listen to it, you're not, able, you're not allowed to listen to it. Like if Bastin were to get up today and say that uh, they've concluded that, uh, you know, pig is a kosher animal and we've been wrong all these years, you can't eat it. Uh, no, the Bastin's wrong just because the Bastin says, I want to say Bastin, the Sanhedrin. If the Sanhedrin gets up and makes a declaration that uh, that you know is wrong, uh, you're not allowed to listen to them. The uh, Rabbi Arya Clapper has a fascinating article um, about the Zakei Mamri. The Zakei Mamri is one who uh, goes against what the Sanhedrin says. Not just goes against in theory, but goes against in practice. So if I'm uh, a Torah scholar and the Sanhedrin rules one thing, I can teach my students that the Sanhedrin is wrong and that the next Sanhedrin will refute them. But I, I can't do is teach them in practice to say the Sanhedrin said that this is what you have to do and I tell my students do otherwise. If I do that, then the Sanhedrin will warn me and say, you can't do that, this is our rule. And if I continue to do that, I'm regarded as a Zuckin Mamri, what they call a rebellious elder. And uh, the punishment for rebellious elder is execution. So Rabbi Arya Clapper discusses this paradox here. Because if you're, this, if you're a Torah scholar and you know the Sanhedrin's wrong, and you know in accordance with Masachat Horayot, you're, not only are you not obligated to listen to them, you can't listen to them, and you have to teach your students in accordance with Horayot that they're wrong. And yet, by doing that, you're a Zakein Mamre. So he develops the idea that the Zakein Mamre is forced because of his conscience to lead to his own death because he has no choice. In order to follow Halakha, he has to teach that the Sanhedrin is wrong. And he has to teach that halacha ma'isa. The Sanhedrin says you can now drink coffee on Yom Kippur. He has to teach that the Sanhedrin's wrong, even though he knows that that is going to make him a zakin mamre, and he is going to be executed. It's a paradox. Rabbi Clapper calls him the gibur hamasora, that we have to look at the zakin mamre, if he's like as you know in a positive way, that he is fighting for the truth as he sees fit and is willing to die for it. It's not the normal way we look at the zakin mamre. So, but this is a big problem because um, how can you say if they tell you what's right is left and what's left is right, you have to listen to them. It, and the Ramban mentions this in Chumash also. Uh, um, the famous example is that Rabbi Gamliel tells Rabbi Yeshua they had a dispute over when, uh, you know, the whole calendar, when's Rosh Hashanah, when's Yom Kippur. And Rabbi Gamliel makes Rabbi Yeshua violate uh, his holiday to come to, was it Yom Kippur, I believe, right? To, uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, I forget, to come to him on that day. But the answer that's usually given is that that's different, that this only applies, al Yamin Shu small, when it comes to the calendar. But every other time, it doesn't. Uh, it, it's a problem. Rav Schechter believes that the expression al yamin shu small refers to if it's a case of sheval tase. That is, if they uh, not if they tell you to do something, but if they tell you to refrain from doing something, then in that case you would listen to them. But if they tell you to actively do something, which you know they're wrong, then masachat horayot will come into play that you do not listen to them. Uh, unless it's a matter, if you know that uh, they're wrong on the calendar, you still have to listen to them. Uh, he, he calls attention to Rav David C. Hoffman. He has an essay on this uh, in the Malamed Holio. There's a different version. Another version of the, the Midrash Halacha is not if they tell you what's right is left and what's right is right, but if they tell you what's right is right and what's left is left. In other words, you not, not that you think they're wrong, but uh, they, they're they actually right, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, that's the first part of his letter. We'll finish up. It's quick. The second part of his letter is uh, going into a church. 
I asked him about that. And he says, absolutely uh, forbidden. Uh, um, I'm going to get back to church in the next tshuva. We'll speak a great deal because the next tshuva is Rav Shalom Masas with a, a really groundbreaking, famous response. And it became a famous response. Um, then I asked him about Pasakum, eating non-Jewish, you're traveling. You don't ever want to travel. If you go to Europe after Israel. So can you have non-Jewish bread? Um, and he says, well, if you're on traveling, you can. Today, though, I look at this and I say, this is strange because uh, he's really giving a hummer, I think. We all eat non-Jewish bread. Uh, um, we don't eat, except during maybe a Sarah Sine Chufa, they, we assume that you can have pas palter, pas non-Jewish bread from a, um, unless he's assuming I mean, that maybe pas palter, if it has ashkacha, it's no longer regarded as pas palter, even though the whole thing is made from a non-Jew. Um, but uh, maybe some we had, we have a Dayan who's listening right now. Maybe you can illuminate this because I always thought that Pasakum, um, the non Jew makes it just because you know it's kosher, a Jew has no involvement, it's still Pasakum, but maybe not. And the last question, two questions I asked him quickly was uh, about the Megillah Sester. There's a commentary on the Sefer of Mitzvos that um, the Ramban says is a ob positive obligation to live in the land of Israel. And the Megillah Sester, that's the name of the commentary says that no, there's no obligation to live in the land of Israel. The only obligation is in the days of the second temple there was and in the days of the Messiah. And this is the Satmar Shita. The Satmar Rebbe likes to quote the Megillah Sester. So um, uh, I wrote with some haaros, some comments on how difficult the um, um, the view of the Megillah Sester is. It contradicts certain uh, you know, important texts we have. Uh, and he writes to me, Yafekatafta, very good. And he says, uh, um, it's it's impossible to say what the um, um, Sester said. And finally, the last thing he said, I asked him about also, uh, you go to a hotel and they serve, let's say, fruit, a fruit cup you want to have. Uh, um, can you do that halachically? Um, and uh, he gave an answer that I'm looking at it now. It seems to me this is not the minhag. He says that if you go and you're traveling, so you have it uh, a cry. Um, you know, occasionally. And he says, occasionally means uh, one day in this hotel, one day in the other hotel, but you shouldn't have it twice in the same hotel. You shouldn't basically be eating in the non-kosher dining room, even if it's kosher stuff. My sense is that the minog is not, that if you're at a hotel for five days, even you go down, if there's fruit there, you take the fruit. Uh, I've seen this on our trips with big rabbis and uh, I, I'd want to ask him maybe once why he says, well, only do it one day, but don't do it a second day. Because if, if, if it's fruit, it's fruit. Uh, it, but that's, that's what he holds. I actually think that this is a humra, not a coup at all. It's, it's, it's a real humra that, he, that he's trying, that he has here. Uh, but I don't know the source. I, when I see him next, maybe I'll ask him again what, uh, why he's so mocked on, um, on not... Uh, I mean, from a body's perspective, <laughs> there's, there's no such thing as a non-kosher uh, thing like this. There's kosher food and non-kosher food. If the food is kosher, you can eat it all you want. It's not the... Um, okay, so we, we, we've gone long enough, I think even over time. Uh, next week, we're going to get into this question, the big question, can you uh, assist, give charity for a Christian to build their church, for Christians to build their church. I'll talk about the context, what that was about. Uh, two very long chew vote from uh, Rabbi Masas and Rabbi uh, Huda Ratzalhenkin. Then we'll get more from um, Rabbi Ratzabi and others. And hopefully next week, I'll introduce you to one of the great Torah scholars of our time, Rabbi Chaim Rappaport. Uh, some of his interesting uh, perspectives. So um, before I go up, um, I will, um, I just see that Mel comments that uh, fruit is fine, but not cut fruit. I, the question was about fruit cup. Um, I don't know what the difference is, cut fruit, and, and why is cut fruit not any different? Uh, cut fruit is also not a problem. Everything's cold. And he's saying you can eat cut fruit. You go to the supermarket, you get a cut watermelon. It's not a problem. But he's saying only one time. Don't make a habit of sitting there. So I also understand why you don't make a habit sitting there, but I would think if you're traveling, you know, uh, two, three, four times is not making a habit. Remember, the note of Yehuda says that travelers are in the status of B'dayavad. That travelers, anything that we usually regard as a, as a B'dayavad, travelers are in that. So travelers can do all sorts of things that regular people can't do. And I would think that, uh, um, 
I mean, he says to eat one time in this hotel, one time in that hotel. The problem is, though, you're at the hotel for three days. So if you're at every day a different hotel, I get it. But if you're at the hotel, um, the same hotel for three days, it's an interesting, um, uh, it could be he's speaking in terms of he's not basing it on Yoradea Halacha, but on sort of like mixing with the non-Jews, mixing with non-kosher. And that might make a distinction also if you're there as a group. You know, when we go in my tours, we're as an entire group. So we're on the... Uh, you know, it's a whole different situation. So I don't know. This is something that I need to clarify uh, further. I've told a few people about, and they, they're they not really sure as to what uh, the, the just the logic is. And every time I see him, I forget to ask him. So, um, okay. Um, Ellen says that the judge was Rabbi Shubo's brother. It may even be that a relationship started in the opposite direction. Oh, the judge in Rabbi Soloveitch's case. Um, Barry says, when Rabbi Shubo was nifter, the Rav stood outside the show in a pouring rain to attend the Levi Rabbi Shubo, who was Hakar Tato. Yes, he couldn't go in the synagogue, the sanctuary, for the funeral, so he stood outside. Mahavdiel, <laughs> so when, uh, the, when Rabbi Ram passed away, uh, one of the Rabbanim from the Washington Heights community, he stood outside, because God forbid he couldn't go into Wayu for the funeral, because YU is like in Cherem for some of these people. So instead, he stood outside. Um, is Rav Yitzhak Ratzabi the brother of Ratzin Ratzabi, the Mishpat Ivri expert? I don't know. I would, I, I don't know. Uh, it's not a completely uncommon name, um, but I don't know. Uh, Baruch says, when I said Svartok rabbis are not regarded as serious Torah scholars, did they rip out the Rift, the Rashba, etc. from the bookshelves? No. But everyone from the Chida and on, they weren't. Everyone knows that the Rambam's a great Torah scholar in the Rift. The point is, though, they don't think that in the last few hundred years, the Svaradim have anyone uh, to measure up. Um, so, um, uh, and they, 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 there's even the joke that uh, the um, the Rambam comes back and tells Reb Chaim a uh, you know, his question and his answer is all wrong. And Rebbe says, ah, what do you expect from a Sephardim? But that, that's obviously a joke. Uh, in, the, in the yeshiva world today, um, the, the canon does not include any Sephardim of the last uh, few hundred years. Even the Chidah is not included in the canon of the mainstream world. It's, you really have to stop uh, maybe the, 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 the Shulchan the Radbaz. After that, it's not uh, part of the canon. So, uh, um, why would Rav Ratzabi want to put Amnon Yitzchak in Cherem? This goes back to the, when, uh, during the elections, when Amnon Yitzchak created his own party, which everyone knew was never going to make enough, uh, uh, get enough seats to get in. So Rav, the point was, and Rav Tzabi was not the only one, Rav Yosef also cursed him, that uh, he's going to hurt the, um, the Shas party by uh, creating his own party. It's just going to take away votes. So from my perspective, it's a terrible thing. You're having a political dispute and someone is out of the fold because he doesn't fall in line for political reasons. Uh, um, that's why, by the way, uh, Rav Shmuel Arbach, whose politics I really are, I find abhorrent and the whole movement, the pellet. But when uh, Rav Chaim Kanievsky said he's a Zakin Mamre, and when he said that uh, anyone who follows Shmuel Arbach can't get an aliyah and shul and can't be a uh, you know, read the Torah and their children need to be thrown out of schools. This is all because of a political thing. The Rishmo Arbach decided not to follow the politics. I, I don't see how you can, um, you know, there should be a separation, Torah and, and, and politics. I feel it's very unfair. You might not agree with Rishmo Arbach's politics, but all of a sudden now you can shofechetamo, as they say, uh, because he decides he doesn't want to listen to uh, Rabbi Steinman. Uh, and I say that even though everything that Rabbi Arbach's followers have done is terrible. Um, but yet, um, you know, they have the right to do that without being considered uh, completely out of the fold, I would think. Um, Baruch was trying to illustrate the absurdity of our dear Dr. Shapiro's words as formulated. I think Reb Baruch, my good friend, that everyone understood when I said that the Sephardim don't count. They weren't referring to the Rambam and, uh, and the Rif and the Ron and all those great sages. They're referring to the contemporary rabbis. Um, you know, the Aguda, they put in, they wanted to bring in all these Sephardim, so they had to put in a token uh, Sephardi, Gadol. So they put in, I think it was Ezra Tia from Parat Yosef, and uh, after one or two sessions, he decided he's not going anymore, because the sessions were all in Yiddish. Can you imagine? They put in the token Sephardi Gadol, and yet they still have the, uh, the sessions in Yiddish. Uh, 
that's why Chacham Avad Yosef finally decided that we don't need this anymore. We can make our own party. And they formed the Shas party. And, um, um, oh, you can fit Mr. Rabbi Yes, Rabbi Lepar was in Toronto. Those who read Hebrew and are in Moroccan material, Rabbi Lepar is really one of the world's experts in the, the traditions of Morocco. Um, why does Fardim go to Ashkenazi yeshivas? Why are they clamoring for entrance to the masochism? No, because um, they, they've been convinced that that's the, uh, the height of Torah learning. And uh, for a while, the truth is, it was the height of Torah learning. There weren't any Sephardic yeshivas. So if you wanted advanced Torah learning, you had to go there. Uh, the problem was that uh, the, the, there's culture and there's Torah. The culture of these institutions put a lot of pressure on them to uh, get rid of their Sephardic backgrounds, their traditions. Uh, the Torah, they were going there for the Torah, supposedly, but together with it, it also, um, Rev Mazuz is, uh, is strong about this. And uh, um, even some of the Gado Sephardic adults, Rev Chacham Avad Yosef, who did so much to turn this around, he sent his kids to uh, uh, Ashkenazic Yeshiva. So why he didn't send his kids to Parat Yosef, that's a different reason. Uh, um, so someone texted that uh, the difference is, I asked about um, why certain things are not in Yoradea. He says, Orachim is what happens every day, Shabbos and holidays. It has a set time. Yoradea happens at no specific time. So uh, Avelos, the morning, it happens when it happens. And Sadaka, that, that works for Avelos. That, that person figured Sadaka also, Sadaka, I think, would go. Um, Shmuel says he hasn't the Yuchud room is an old Ashkenazi custom. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how far back the Yuchud room. Uh, Baruch, why don't Sephardim go to their own yeshivas? Uh, today they've started to. That's the Shas revolution. If you saw Chacham Avad Yosef's funeral, you saw tens of thousands of Sephardic yeshiva bachrim. That's all in the space of two generations. Now they do go, many of them. Uh, they're in, in the Sephardic world now, you have two types of Har Sephardi Haredi. You have you have Sephardi Haredim who are really Ashkenazi, part of the Ashkenazi world, and they take their orders from the Ashkenazic elite. And then there's, but now we have real Sephardic uh, institutions, but this is all, uh, this is due. And Baruch also says, maybe the Sephardic Derech Halimut is better in some ways. You know, that's, that, that's what Rabbi Mazu says, uh, that our way is better. And uh, yeah, the, the, the Ari was half and half, he had both. Um, um, Someone asked what happened to Evan Ezer. Evan Ezer comes after Yoradeh. We're going to get to Evan Ezer. Uh, um, yes, Rabbi Klein wrote, if you look in Rabbi Klein's book, he has more than one book, but his book, Halachic Studies or something like that, he talks about the swordfish. Hyman says that Rav Schechter has also weighed in and asserted that the swordfish is definitely kosher. Yes, we got to that, but nods are of Tenor saying that his heart was in the right place. Exactly. Um, and that's what I uh, posted. Um, how many Posei Kadors are there? Uh, good question. I don't know. <laughs> uh, what was Rosh Hashanah's basis for Asari Swordfish? He thought that there's no uh, scales. Um, Rav Soloveitchik, according to Professor Sternberg, Rav Soloveitchik ruled that Swordfish is kosher. Rav Savitsky, who was, uh, we mentioned him last class, and Rav Soloveitchik's adversary in the early years, although later they got together. Uh, Rav Savitsky once in the, sh I heard this from his son, Ramosha Savitsky, not the Rosh Yeshiva. There's a son named Moshe who's a rabbi in uh, Fatlush. His brother is the Rosh Yeshiva at um, Torah Vidas that we mentioned a few classes ago. But I heard from Rabbi Moshe Savitsky that um, Shabbos Hagadol, Shabbos Hagadol Drasha, or Shabbos Shuvah, I forget which one, Rabbi Mordechai Savitsky declared that swordfish is kosher, that he had been to the Boston Harbor. He checked it out, it was absolutely kosher. But his wife, the Rebbitson, I heard from the son, refused to allow it in the house. Uh, um, most people on Lakewood these days eat only pasty straw. I mean, because you have it there. You, so uh, everyone assumes that if you can get regular uh, kosher pasty straw, you shouldn't eat pasakum. The question is, let's say the pasakum is cheaper. Then you can, but if it's the same price or almost the same, uh, everyone says you should uh, get it. There's a hetter to eat pas halter. So uh, Hyman says the pas palter is hector is commercially baked bread. Pas you're saying, but it, what's a bakery? Bakery, we assume, is pas palter. I guess that's commercially uh, baked bread uh, as well. But the question I asked, uh, I asked Rav Schechter was, uh, I'll show it to you. It was uh, precisely about when you're traveling, uh, 
and um, he says, Pasakum, Imein Bachshash Trefus, Imu Pas Palter, Mutsas Bashasat Chakun, Seyabaderich. So he's saying, or Shachter is saying that only as a traveler, because you're like in this Diavid situation. So if you're a traveler, you go to this bakery and you can uh, eat it uh, if it's kosher. But normally, if you're home, you wouldn't. Um, but how does that uh, paspalter, the bread that we eat, is paspalter, isn't it? Uh, you go to a bakery, um, it's a non Jewish bakery, it's under Hashkacha. I guess Hashkacha makes it not paspalter, it makes it pasisrol. Is that, is that the Svara? Um, in France, everyone, including the the the, the Haredim, eat these big breads that um, you buy on the street because they're all known to be kosher. Those are all paspalter. The the, the gra is strict on this. Um, I don't know. I, I'm just thinking off the top of my head that with hashkacha, maybe you'll say it's not considered paspalter because the hashkacha makes it sort of like a pasisrol because a, a lot of the bakeries are non-Jewish bakeries under hashkacha. Um, a couple other things. So Hyman says, Pas Yisrael requires simply that you light the oven, at least for Ashkenazi. And the problem is that um, uh, all these breads, you have plenty of bakeries, which they Jew doesn't do that. And uh, we give hashgacha to them and you get uh, commercial pro bread products that Jew doesn't like the oven. And we assume those are pasakum. So they say, you shouldn't eat these breads. You buy Arnold's bread or whatever it is. Uh, during a Sarasim Chuva, you should only buy the Jewish bread. But Rav Shachter was saying that only when you're, on the, the path. So does that mean that Rav Shechter holds that normally you can't buy all these OU breads in the supermarket because those are paspalter. Uh, and the header is that uh, you can buy them because they're cheaper or because they're more available, they're easier. If you're living in my town, uh, you don't have to go all the way down to Lakewood to go to the supermarket to get the Cicero. Jennifer Badani says, cut fruit doesn't sit right with me. Well, I don't know what to say. There's no problem with cut fruit. Uh, uh, they asked Rav Yasha, there are other people that didn't sit right with him, they asked him about these cut watermelons in the supermarket, and they said, it's not a problem, what could the problem be? So you're gonna say, well, they used it to, um, this is in, uh, it's in the book, actually, Rav really Force's book on kosher. So you're gonna say they use it to cut the non-kosher stuff, and Rav Yasha's response was, you can be sure that after cutting it, they're gonna clean it off. Uh, um, who stood outside of Ram's front row? You can ask me, uh, Privately, uh, the Chidon, the Ben uh, they were not taken seriously in the Ashkenazi Yeshivas, never. Uh, Chida from a Kabbalistic theme, it's always holy, but never his, his works are never cited, and the Ben was never cited or studied either. Um, uh, is it feasible to assume that a response given is from Atali in 1985 or 86, 35 years ago, may no longer be correct? Uh, yeah, sure, it's, uh, uh, it's possible. I just saw uh, the other day that Rav Yosef's grandson writes that uh, you can't rely on what his grandfather says about going in a Shabbos elevator because the technologies change. So it's definitely in certain cases, if it, but other cases, I mean, it depends on the circumstance. If it's a, if it's a question where it doesn't really change, uh, if it deals with technology. Um, and also, the, 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 I would say the questions that are deal with metahalacha sort of questions I was given at Brandeis, if it's a completely new environment and a new clientele, you could say, it's not the same issue. So the response from the Rechiak of Weinberg, when he's 1950s France, that's not the same in the 1980s France, where they're very religious. In the 1950s, it was uh, to find Shomer Shabbos was uh, not so simple. Uh, so obviously that uh, changed. Um, um, Take the example, Natali says, of wearing a yarmulke in the workplace. Many of us were told we could work without a yarmulke in the office. I wonder if today we would get, get the same um, heter. Uh, it's interesting you use the word heter on the assumption that you need a heter. Uh, if you came from Germany or you came from the Sephardic lands, you knew in, in, in Aleppo they didn't wear a yarmulke. It was just understood they didn't. Um, today, uh, no one who works in New York you can work in a top New York law firm and wear a yarmulke. I don't think it's a problem. But on the other hand, I know someone who works in a law firm and he doesn't, he's very religious, so, but he doesn't, he's someone who learns every day, but he doesn't want to be seen as a, uh, he doesn't want to be judged as a Jew. He doesn't want, if he makes a mistake, they do that. So there's all sorts of uh, reasons. Uh, it, what I'm interested in, as you say, if you get the same Hector, this idea that do you even need to get a Hector to wear a yarmulke? 
uh, did not to wear a yarmulke. I mean, growing up, everyone knew that if you went to work, you didn't need to wear it. It's a, it's a nice thing if you did. Uh, uh, I'm in laments that uh, his son-in-law, a Persian, uh, speaks, learns, and wears a fedora like an Ashkenazi instead of a fez. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so Hyman's saying if it's kosher, it's still pasakum, but uh, that's my, but we're not no hey, like Rav Shechter said. Uh, all of us, basically, buy f stuff in the supermarket. Uh, we go to bakeries that are under, uh, you go to a bagel store, which is owned by a non-Jew, it's under Hashgachli. You find these everywhere. Uh, um, Jennifer says, what about Ethiopian Jews who eat chicken with dairy? This is a problem, and Rav Shechter is going to deal with it. I asked him about this question. Not in this, in another, in a future uh, letter. What about the Ethiopians who don't know about some of the takanot in the Gemara? We'll talk about Rav Shechter, and we'll talk about the book that came out a couple of years ago by this Ethiopian rabbi who studied at Harat Sion, which has an approbation from Renachar Rabinovich, and he makes the case that Ethiopians don't need to be bound by mainstream halacha because of their tradition something which Rav Shechter absolutely rejects, and I find it hard to accept uh, this Ethiopian rabbi's position that uh, because they didn't know about things, that this is, quote, a minhag. But we'll get into that. It's an excellent uh, question. Um, um, okay. Uh, Naftali, coming from Washington Heights, they even asked in 1975, that's interesting. Washington Heights is a very halacha community, but the practice in, in Germany, every, no one wore a yarmulke to go to work. Uh, no one in Frankfurt. There was never any assumption that that you would. Uh, um, you say 75, you can still see in 1975, Rav Nebensal's father, he was on the Agronaut Commission. That was, after, that was around 75, and you can still see him in pictures there without wearing a yarmulke. And he was a from from yeki. So um, it's interesting that even 75, they would... Uh, thought that you need to ask the question. But obviously, and I'll end with this, Naftali's point is, uh, is, is, is correct that some questions, uh, of course, only apply to the context uh, of the time and the situation you're in. We will get into some of them. Ah, we've gone long today. Thank you very much. Again, I'll leave it now to our uh, wonderful host, Rabbi Kelman, with some announcements. Right. Oh, announcements. We announced it earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Tomorrow morning, Marty Lakshin, Tanakh. Uh, you know, you read the emails. That's all the announcements. So I announced before. But thank you. I said uh, you go for an hour full and then you take the questions as long as it takes. That's uh, We appreciate that greatly, that the uh, extra time you're always willing to spend to answer all questions. And uh, I think everybody here appreciates it. And, uh, all and of course, not everyone needs to agree, I, but I give you my perspective. And yep. uh, I love, Baruch, you can keep fighting with me in the uh, um, in the comments. I love it. So, um, and everyone else, thank you very much for the questions. And uh, God willing, we'll see you next week.